There have been numerous deaths at this precipice that marks the peak of this pathway from Nu'uanu to Windward Oahu. Today, Hawaii's Most Haunted talks about the Nu'uanu Pali. Beyond the cool waters and trade winds of our idealistic paradise is the thin veil which separates our world from the place where the shadows talk back. Welcome to Hawaii's Most Haunted. Depending on who they're speaking to, when people ask, why is the Pali so haunted? They might hear several different answers, and most of those answers might be true. This powerful, spiritual haunting place has a long and violent history. It's not just one thing that haunts this place. It's many. Well known by Hawaii's people, Kalelea Ka'anai was the last stand of Oahu chief Kalani Kupule and his 9,000 warriors against Kamehameha and his invading army of 12,000 warriors from Hawaii. Kalani Kupule's army, already weakened from the Battle of Aiea and a failed attempt to seize two well-armed merchant vessels, were outnumbered and outgunned. Anticipating Kamehameha's attack, he stationed his chiefs at strategic points throughout the Nu'uanu Valley. The landing of Kamehameha's forces along the beaches from Waikiki to Waialai was unopposed by the commoners they encountered, and Hawaii's warriors took four days to gather food and scout out enemy positions. The first battle clashed near Punchbowl Crater and moved upland from there. The final spot, the Nu'uanu Pali, was the end of the grueling six-mile battle. The Oahu forces were defeated, either by jumping off the precipice or by hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was desirable to be killed in battle, for then your mana would be preserved for your bloodline rather than be captured and turned into a slave or be sacrificed and your bones be made into tools like fish hooks. Many Oahu warriors were able to escape over into Kalihi and the windward side, including Kalani Kupule. But there were hundreds of soldiers who fought for hours and hours to the very end in order to help their elite and their comrades escape. The late Mayor John H. Wilson, who in his youth built the first road over the Pali, told about visiting the area on a surveying trip and finding more than 800 skulls together with other human bones littering the ground beneath the cliff. Many skulls were collected and sold to museums while it is said that the rest were left where they were and the skeletons were buried by the dirt and rock that came from the construction of the road. Many people claim to have seen warriors late at night at the Pali. Tall, muscular men dressed in malo, holding spears or leo mano, the shark tooth weapon. One popular story is about a couple who were seeing each other for five years. One day, to her confusion, the woman found out that the man she'd been seeing for the past five years was married and had children. In a fit of momentary insanity, the woman called her boyfriend and told him to meet her at the Pali. She told him if he didn't show, she would go to his wife's job and tell her everything. And then she would go to his children's school and tell them everything. In a panic, the man agreed to meet. Driving as fast as he could with little thought to the speed limits, he parked his car and ran toward the lookout to see his girlfriend standing on top of the wall. With the ambient light of Kaneohe silhouetting her, he could see that she had a gun pointed to her own head. Whoa, 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 babes, don't do this. Just come down and let's talk about it. Now you want to talk? The woman is incredulous. After five years, now you want to talk. Two police officers drive up and approach the couple with their flashlights drawn. The man recognizes them as his friends and runs up to the officers, urging them to stop. We're just having a disagreement, he said. I got it handled. The officers nod, and as the man turns to head back to where the woman is standing, he runs directly into someone and is knocked to the ground. When he looks up, he sees a giant Hawaiian warrior with his palm out, facing him as if to say, don't go any further. In a blink, the warrior is gone, 
and with the flashlights from the policeman still shining on her, he can now see that the woman has been holding a second gun, tucked close to her side, facing directly at him. Her plan was to kill him first, and then herself after. While the man apologized profusely and kept her attention, the officers were able to get close enough to subdue her. In a heartbreaking scene, she was removed from the wall and handcuffed. The man had no idea who the Hawaiian warrior was, and it seemed that no one else saw the warrior. Perhaps that warrior was an ancestor. Whoever he was, he saved that man's life. An even older story than Kalelea Ka'anai is that of Pele and Kamapua'a. Have you ever gone out with someone who your family and friends told you was the complete wrong person for you to be with, but you went out with that person anyway? It's the same situation with Pele and Kamapua'a. Pele's family tells her he is the complete opposite of yourself and completely wrong for you, but she does not listen and indulges in the relationship anyway. Now, Kamapua'a cohabitates with Pele in Kilauea. Daily, Pele stays home and stokes the fires of the volcano, while Kamapua'a is out and about doing whatever it is that pig gods do. But soon, people from a nearby village approach the edge of the crater and look down and see Pele. And they call, Eh, hey, Pele, eh. And she looks up. Ah, away Pele. Aya no kaukane ke kahavai. Me elua malwa hine ho o kahimanava. Pele, your husband is in a stream making love with two women at the same time. Sa! She says. Chases them away. A few days later, people from another nearby village approach the edge of the crater and look down and see the fire goddess stoking the flames of the volcano, and they call, Eh, Pele, eh, I know kau kane, ike kumula au, me kolomau wa hine ho kai malava. Pele, your husband is in the branches of a breadfruit tree, making love with three women, all at one time. Tsa! And chases them away, and they leave. It's not until Pele's own sisters come down into the volcano, and sit around her, begin to comb out her hair and massage her shoulders, and they say, Awe, e pele, kaukane, aya no, i kamawana, i hapuna, me elima mau wahine ho kahimanava. Alas, pele, there is your husband in the ocean at hapuna, making love with five women all at once. Later on that day, as Kamapua'a is returning home to Kilauea, he notices an unusual sight, a tidal wave coming down from the mountains, blotting out the sun. But as he looks closer, he realizes it is a tidal wave, but one made of lava. And he says to himself, Awe, she found out. The fires of Pele pursue the pig god, no matter where he tries to hide and run, the flames are quick on his heels until he runs into a place called Kauku, right outside of Hilo. He lays flat on the ground and begins to pray, and the earth rises up and roots from great trees rise up, holding back the flames, and then the Ua Kalilehua, the Hilo rain, torrential, cooling down the fires. Pele appears to Kamapua'a now and says, I suppose I cannot kill you. So, what shall we do? Kamapua'a says, let us make this agreement, with the exception of Moloka'i, where I was defeated in battle, that the Ko'olau side of every island will be mine, lush, green, filled with rains, and that the Kona side of every island will be yours, dry, arid, hot, and that none shall cross into the other's territory. And Pele's reply is, Aoya, it is assumed that it is because of this mo'olelo, this incident between Pele and Kamapua'a, that you cannot bring the spiritual embodiment of Kamapua'a 
from the windward to the leeward side. This is supposedly why we're told not to bring pork over the pulley. On Tuesday, April 29th, 1947, at 12.45 a.m., a group of five men and women entered the police headquarters and told the Midnight Watch Police Lieutenant, Philip Chong, that they had just seen an apparition at the Pulley Lookout. The group said that they were discussing the supernatural and learned that on certain conditions, spooks could be seen on the Pulley. They took it as a joke and decided to test the theory by going to the Pulley at midnight and bringing with them some raw pork and fish. They parked and waited, and just a short while later, a 20-year-old woman alerted the group to a large figure of a man sitting on the side of the hill with his arms locked over his knees. Each time the car lights were turned on, the man moved. He then reappeared in a different place when the lights were turned off. Then the ghost, they said, changed his shape to that of an animal. The night was dark and there was no moon, yet the group could see the figure plainly. Having their fill of the supernatural at that point, the group decided to leave. They tossed the pork and fish out of the car, and at that instant, the odor of death and decomposition permeated the air. Was this the manifestation of Kamapua'a? Before Wilson and White House built the first drivable road over the Pulley, which was completed in 1898, the initial road, barely more than a footpath, was a treacherous one, especially in times of bad weather. In November 1874, the Hawaiian Gazette describes a rainstorm that set in with an easterly wind, culminating in a hurricane. The storm uprooted trees, broke off branches, and destroyed fences but passed on without much more serious effects. However, in tearing down trees and soaking the soil, the storm weakened the walls of the pulley and succeeded in claiming the life of a man named Nahoy, the man who had traveled constantly over the pulley as a messenger between a windward plantation and Honolulu, was ascending the path on horseback with a pack mule in tow when rocks began to slide overhead. He tried to hasten his animals ahead, but his horse was struck and then almost immediately a large stone struck Nahoy on the head. Another man who'd witnessed the accident rushed forward to help him, but Nahoy was already dead. The building of the road itself was just as perilous. In 1897, a man named Kilauea was killed by being thrown over the side of the pulley by the discharge of powder used in blasting the new road. The Luna who was responsible for blasting away the rock and dirt down along the side of the pulley was Joe Puni. Kilauea was his second in charge. While he was working with a team of setting charges in deep, narrow holes along the cliff face, one of the charges failed to go off as expected. Kilauea went back to try to light the powder when the charge suddenly went off and Kilauea was thrown into the air and landed on a ledge 40 feet down the side. That Kilauea might have survived, and that might have been the end of it, if he hadn't rolled off the ledge and fallen another 170 feet. When the crew found him, his skull was crushed in front and his mouth badly mangled. Bruises covered his body. Kilauea left behind a wife and a one-month-old baby in what the newspapers called the most indignant circumstances, with nothing to eat and nothing to wear. The wife was reportedly almost on the verge of desperation in her hovel on Kukui Lane. White House and Wilson, the men who held the contract for the road over the pulley, left $50 with the woman to defray the funeral expenses of her husband. It was explained that they did this out of the goodness of their hearts because Kilauea was, in no way, under them. He was employed by Joe Puni, to whom a certain part of the work had been contracted. The official pulley road opened in January 1898 to the excitement of the general public. Now it was wide enough to handle horse-drawn carriages, but travel was often still hazardous. The newspapers tell of numerous accounts of horse accidents. 
car crashes, suicides, and murder. Other witnesses have claimed to see a procession of spirits marching at the pulley and through the valley below. From the pulley along the ridge through Kanyakapupu to Puiva, through Mount Naala and through Nu'uwanu Valley, walk the sleepless specters of Hawaii's night marchers. When the phase of the moon and the elements of nature are just right, the warriors follow their path, escorting their li'i, marching in death, as they did in life. The night marchers announce themselves by the sound of the pu, the hollow sound of air forced through a conch shell. Sometimes one will hear the rhythmic pounding of drums and the pulsing cadence of stomping feet. One may see a line of torches being held by the ghostly hand of ancient warriors, but not always, and the smell of sulfur may be present. When these signs appear, one would be well advised to make himself scarce as quickly as possible, for if you are caught as witness to the ghost army, your life will be forfeit. If you are so unlucky as to let the warning signs pass unheeded, your best chance at escaping alive is to lay prostrate with your head down, never looking up until the procession has passed. If you know it, you can chant your mo'oku auho, your genealogy chant, in hopes that an ancestor is present in that procession and you will be claimed and not killed. Other sources say that one should strip naked and urinate, rubbing the liquid all over your body in hopes that the night marchers find you disgusting and not right in the head. For those considered feeble-minded were thought to be touched by the gods and were left alone to fend for themselves. The procession of the Menehune is also said to make its way from Hawaii Island stopping at a place on each island as they make their way to Kauai. When they reach Oahu, it is said that the Menehune climb to the peak of Pu'ulanihuli before coming down the ridge to the Pali area where they have their meal before traveling on to their home in Wainiha on Manoa Kalanipo, also known as Kauai. The procession travels in a single line in the dark of night, making their way to their resting spots before the sun comes up. In 1929, Harold K. L. Castle built his grand mansion on a 20-acre estate at the base of the Pulley, 500 feet above sea level. The estate had a steep cliff face jutting up to one side and sweeping views of the windward coast on the other. When it was built, there was no Pulley Highway, and a narrow road wound its way through a thick forest of bamboo and banyan trees. That little road crossed over Kahanaiki Stream before opening to a wide courtyard exposing a grand home that seemed to be magically suspended from the slopes of the pulley. The 25-room mansion, its supplementary buildings, garage, kennels, and mountain road were built at the cost of about $300,000. Known as Paliku, the home entertained such celebrities as Spanish nobility, war heroes, and Hollywood film stars. But only after 17 years, in June of 1946, the Castle family sold the estate to the Roman Catholic Church for only $200,000. The estate then became St. Stephen's Seminary. Part of the building with its mirrors and Venetian candlesticks became the seminary's chapel. The private library became the main classroom. And one wing of the top floor was screened in and became the dormitory, where the teenage seminarians and their teachers, priests the boys routinely called father, slept. Each seminarian had a bed, a chair, and on top of the chair, a stainless steel washbowl about four to five inches deep. The dorm looked out at the police slopes that were barely a stone's throw away. The boys were sleeping in their beds one night in October of 1946. From high up on the hill, a sound could be heard in the distance. One priest described it as a tapping, another more like a clicking, a methodical clicking. It came closer and closer edging down the mountain like a swollen river. Father Cullinan listened, transfixed, as whatever was causing the tapping came closer and closer, then entered the room. Suddenly, the stainless steel basins came alive. The tapping rattled the bowls up and down the rows of beds faster and faster. Then the tapping 
went back up the mountain. Father Cullinan watched as this happened several times that night. The clamor was so loud that it woke the young men from their slumber. All except one. This one young seminarian slept through the entire racket, but he was not left undisturbed. His neck started to swell up to the size of a grapefruit. Father Cullinan put a crucifix next to the sleeping boy's neck, and the swelling subsided. The presence responsible for the earlier tapping came to a stop at the boy's bed. Father Lynn and Father Cullinan watched in horror as the boy's body was pushed deep into the bed, then brought back up over and over again. He didn't levitate or actually leave the bed. It was as if he was pressed deeper down by a strong man, then released. Yet through all of this, no one, nothing visible, was there. Then, whatever it was, left the boy alone, but it wasn't gone. Down a spiral staircase from the dormitory was a huge kitchen. Father Cullinan said they soon heard the sound of pots and pans and dishes being thrown around, a cacophony of sound. When the noise stopped, they went down to investigate. Dishes, pots, and pans were strewn all over. Soon after, then Bishop James Sweeney came out and closed the seminary because of this incident. Sweeney requested the priests not to discuss what they witnessed. Only when they were asked years later to describe what really happened, they finally opened up and told the tale. In 1961, retired Bishop of Honolulu, Joseph Ferrario, said he understood a blessing was done, but it probably wasn't an exorcism. The boy who slept through what has now been termed a diabolical obsession never returned. Seminarians have long talked of attacks by levitating pencils, of doors that would stick on one side, but not the other, of pots that rattled without cause. Even lay people who work at the religious institution talk of feeling a presence, hearing a voice, having something press against them. We hear about diabolical possession all the time. It's in books and movies. It's everywhere. But diabolical obsession is a bit different. There is no taking over the body. According to the church, diabolical obsession refers to the hostile action of the devil or an evil spirit besetting anyone from without. In this instance, the clattering of the bowls and dishes, the pressing of the boy into his bed. Now, this isn't just a ghost story that's been passed along. Whatever happened at the seminary, according to Ferrario, happened. There is no question about that. It was real, he said, told and corroborated by prominent men in the Roman Catholic Church. So, what was causing all the ruckus? Why did the Castle family sell their sprawling estate only 17 years after its creation? And why did they sell it to the church for $100,000 less than what they spent to build it? Was the family of Paliku having supernatural experiences before the sale? Being at the foot of the Pali, was the mansion built on the trail of the ghostly night marchers? Was it Menehune, causing trouble as they traveled through this place on their way to their destination? Were the spirits of warriors from Kalelea Ka'anai disturbed by the mansion being built where it was? Did the builders happen to disturb the bones of the dead? Perhaps the spirits of those many who lost their lives in falls, crashes, accidents, murders, or suicide happened to culminate in that area? Or did this young seminarian bring something unseen with him to the seminary? Who knows?